Okay, good morning again, ladies. Uh, I hope everybody had a very restful weekend and we're ready to, um, to just kickstart the week and we are ready to finish the term strong. Uh, we have a week to go. And so we look forward to the break because I'm sure that, you know, most of us, we are in need of some, some rest at this point. All right. Um, this morning we have to present or uh, to do the lecture for us, Mrs. Dan Davis. And I'm just going to give a short introduction of her before, before I hand over to her. So Mrs. Davis hails from the parish of St. Andrew. She was born in the inner city community of Craig Town and attended Mona High School. She went on to the Michael Teachers College, you know, Michael University College, where she completed a diploma in information studies and English literature. She began her formal teaching career at Pembroke High School in 2010. Uh, however, prior to that, she had some uh, several voluntary teaching positions, uh, such as you know, preparing adults for CSEC English and assisting at a school for the deaf. During her employment at Pembroke High, she taught social studies across all grade levels and prepared students for CSEC for 10 years. She also taught library skills, history, literature, and English during her tenure. She's currently in the process of completing a degree in language and literature at the Michael University College. Ladies and gentlemen, let's make welcome Mrs. Dion Davis. And I'm going to now turn over to her. Mrs. Davis. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, ladies and the gentlemen. It's so good to be here this morning with you to share. And I'm looking forward to a very productive hour. Now, um, let's just get right into it. Mrs. Um, Kushni had sent you a PowerPoint presentation, right, Mrs. Kushni? Yes, I did. Okay, so Mrs. Kushni sent you a PowerPoint presentation looking at the evolution of the integrated movements within the Caribbean. Do you have any questions? Do you need any clarification about that, ladies? You are aware that you will have to open your mics and speak with me, okay? Yes, miss. Okay, so I'm seeing 55 persons on the, I'm seeing 55 persons, including the three teachers on the call. Oh, sorry, 67. So I might expect that one person is speaking for 67. I'm a very interactive person, students. So you have to communicate with me. I'm not used to closed mics at all. Good morning, Miss. I have a question. Yes. Can you explain how CARIFTA differs from CARICOM, please? How CARIFTA differs from CARICOM? That's an excellent question. No, CARIFTA was more limited in the scope of what it wanted to do. And therefore, when they conceptualized CARICOM, then it was broadened. So let me bring up the PowerPoint presentation here. Am I able to share screen, Miss? You should be able to, or if you want, I could share for you. Okay, all right. Um, let me come back to you. All right, ladies, before I, I continue answering that question, no, the integrated movement within the Caribbean, it is interesting to note that the integrated movement within the Caribbean also followed the political development 
of the countries within the Caribbean. So when you look at the West Indies Federation, you would have seen that none of the countries that were a part of the Federation were actually independent. All of the countries were a colony of the British, the United Kingdom at that time. Therefore, they were very limited in what they could do in regards to making their own decisions as a unit. And if you look at in the slide, um, let me share screen now. Right, let me go up right here. So right here, I had inserted this slide. I had inserted this slide for a reason because it shows something that is very important. It's that the federal government was headed by an executive governor general appointed by the queen. Now, if you look in the photograph, you will see right there, it is Princess Margaret that is actually there overseeing what is taking place, the meeting that is taking place there. So the West Indies Federation, all the countries included in the West Indies Federation were not actually independent states. And of course, the demise of the West Indies Federation came in 1962, but it was not a loss. It was not a loss for the region because Again, politically, the region developed. So in 1962, you know what significance 1962 had for Jamaica. On August 1, 1962, we gained our independence, right? And therefore, we were now free to make our own decisions. So too were a number of Caribbean countries that had previously gained their independence, namely Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, and Barbados. Those countries were all independent states by the 1960s. So Carifta now, here we see that Carifta, here we see that Carifta was formed in 1968, and the countries had recently become independent, as I had stated before. And it was intended to unite economies and give them a joint presence in the inter on the international scene. So Carifta was more focused on free trade. It, were, it was more focused on getting the economies of the region integrated and moving along to a point where we would become sustainable in our development. So CARIFTA differs from CARICOM where the focus was more on economical, economical integration and economical improvement as a joint venture between the Caribbean countries. Then we move on to CARICOM. So here we see the, the focus of Car CARIFTA increasing buying and selling of goods among, among the member states, diversifying trade, liberalizing trade, and ensuring fair competition. And all of those, all of those focused on economy. So we carry come now, and let me just skip over all of that because you have that to read. And the links in the presentation are actually live links. So they can, they will take you to, for instance, the CARICOM website. I've included links so you can do further reading on your own. So the CARICOM, the CARICOM community began in 1973 and it replaced Carifta, which was a free trade area. And it expanded. It expanded to include political integration as well as social integration. So in 
So right here we see the three objectives of the community as it, at its inception were economic integration, coordination of foreign policy and functional cooperation in areas such as health, education and culture and other areas related to human and social development. And if you go on the link that is included in this slide, CARICOM, CaribbeanElections.com, then you will see more about the objectives of CARICOM. I'm hoping that that answers your question. This map right here, it shows you where the CARICOM member countries are. So all the countries that are in yellow would be countries that are included in the CARICOM members. So we have, and students, I want you to remember that the Caribbean is not just the islands of the Great and, and the Lesser Antilles. It is geographically defined as all countries that have a shoreline on the Caribbean Sea. So that would include countries that are in the Lesser and Greater Antilles, as well as countries on the mainland. Also, a part of the Caribbean is countries that, are, that have a historic link, a close historic link to the Caribbean, to the region. So even though Guyana and Suriname and they, they do not have a coastline on the Caribbean Sea, but historically we are linked. So historically, based on who colonized the region at what time and the migrants that came from various regions to the Caribbean, Historically, Guyana and the Suriname are included in the Caribbean. Do we have any more questions? Ladies, do we have any more questions pertaining to these slides that were sent? Oh, miss. Okay, I am very, I must have done a very good job in putting that slide together. Since there are no more questions, we will move on. So let me just finish up summarizing the evolution of the car of the, hold a moment, please. I'm sorry about that students. It is a very difficult time we're facing when we have two and three schools taking place in one room. So sorry about that. That was very distracting for me just now. All right, so let us continue quickly with the evolution of the movements within the Caribbean. I'd stop sharing my screen, let me go back. Okay, so we see the organization of Eastern Caribbean states. And we might wonder to ourselves, why is it that we have CARICOM, right? And we have the CSME, CARICOM, single, single, single market and economy. So why is it that these little countries now decided that they are going to go ahead and make a an integrated movement of their own. If they're already included in CARICOM, why should they go ahead and make this other unit? Now, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS, 
was established in 1981 and it is an 11 member grouping of islands across the Eastern Caribbean. Now, on the map that I just showed you and uh, from primary school until now, we would, have been, we would have been very familiar with our place on the Caribbean map and we know that we are a part of the Greater Antilles, which when you look on the Caribbean map, there is this clear distinction between the Greater Antilles and the Lesser Antilles. In terms of the size of the countries in the Greater Antilles, it's far greater than the size of the countries in the Lesser Antilles. And also the proximity to us is far greater than they are with each other. Now, the Eastern Caribbean consists of all of those countries that are in the Lesser Antilles those English speaking Caribbean countries, Martinique and Guadeloupe. Martinique being a French speaking country and Guadeloupe being a uh, Spanish speaking country. Now, these countries, because of their size and their close proximity to each other, it is, it is reasonable to say that their relationship and their dealings would be more it, there would be, it would be closer than that of uh, with the Greater Antilles or those countries that are mainland territories like Guyana and uh, Suriname and Belize. Now, these countries, because of their close proximity to each other, the fact that they are more affected when you see a hurricane, for instance, when a hurricane or any, any natural disaster that comes to the region, if it comes from the Lesser Antilles side, then all or most of the countries are impacted in one sweep. So they have to work closer together as a unit, as a group of countries, being that they are more affected, they are more, they are more affected by natural disasters or anything that will happen and they have common problems. The problems that Antigua and Barbuda have in terms of with their size, we as Jamaicans don't have it. Right now, within our whole COVID fight, the impact that COVID is having on the region, if you realize the lesser Antilles, the smaller countries can take, they can take measures that are more difficult to implement in a larger island of 3 million people such as Jamaica. So in Antigua and Barbuda, it was very easy for them to lock their country and say, hey, nobody leaves, nobody goes. Within the first part of the pandemic there, it's also easier for them to share resources. In the Lesser Antilles, they have a common, they have a common money, right? They have a common currency. It would, it's easier for them as a smaller group of countries because all of these countries combined still do not come up with the population size that Jamaica has, believe it or not because none of these countries come even remotely close to being a million people strong. So having a common, co common currency, it is economical for them. It is, it is more logical for them to have a common currency and it is easier for their economies to be tighter or linked together than it is for the larger countries such as Jamaica, Cuba, Haiti, Guyana, to join with them, to have a common currency and to work as closely with them. So the OECS was, was formed in 1981. Again, you will see that there is a link there that will take you to the OECS website where you can do further reading on your own. Now, the Association of Caribbean States was established in 1995. Again, you may wonder, why is it 
that we have CARICOM and there is OECS and we have CARICOM single market and economy and yet there is the need for an association of Caribbean states. This was established in 1994 in Colombia and it promotes cons consultation, cooperation and concerted action among all the countries of the Caribbean and when they say all the countries of the Caribbean, it also includes South American countries. Eight other non-independent Caribbean countries are eligible for associate membership. And within the, all the integrated movements, you will realize because of our dynamic political makeup within the Caribbean, we have some countries that are republics, we have some countries that are um, constitutional monarchies, and we have some countries that are still under colonial rule. So because of these, this dynamic, the associate membership is there for those countries that are not independent states. So countries such as Turks and Caicos, Turks and Caicos is not, a, Turks and Caicos is not an independent country they are still under British rule. They are associate members, right? So in all the integrated movements that uh, that facility has been made. And again, I've included a link to that website so that you may visit and do further reading. So as we have seen the integration movement within the Caribbean has evolved with the region's political, economic and social development needs. That I should not be there, sorry. It is noticeable that there exists within the territory smaller and larger groups of countries that work with each other for the long-term sustainability of the region. Even within the integrated movements, the dynamic and ever-changing culture of the region's people is evident. So we are done with that. Let me stop sharing this screen. And we are going to now go on to look at some of the institutions, and we will not be able to cover all of them based on the time, but some of the institutions that exist within the integrated movement, and we are going to look at their achievements and their challenges, and we are going to begin with CARICOM. So again, let me go to sharing my screen. So we will briefly look at, and as I said before, we'll be able to cover all of them, the achievements and challenges of the following bodies, the, CARICOM, the Caribbean community, CARICOM, the CSME, CARIMAC, CXC, UE, West Indies Cricket Board, Regional Safety and Security, and the CDB. Now, I began with CARICOM because it is the largest there. I think we've done very well in terms of functional cooperation. If every country in CARICOM had set up their own examination system, instead of having the Caribbean Examination Council, it would be difficult for much of the smaller islands that have fewer resources than we do. And this is a quote from Mr. Golden, former prime minister of Jamaica. Now, Mr. Golden was speaking about one of the achievements of CARICOM. So he was, and I've included the article from JIS. So Mr. Golden was essentially saying he was defending the achievements of CARICOM because there are many in the Caribbean, both educated and opinionated that would say that CARICOM has been a huge failure, but it has not been. And as a matter of fact, a fact, uh, an interesting fact that CARICOM is the largest, is the longest, sorry. CARICOM is the longest established 
integrated movement within the developing world. So not within the region, not within um, the Indies, the new, um, new world America, the Americas, no. It is the, la the longest standing integrated movement within the developing world. So let us go to that article briefly. Okay, so we're having a bit of a glitch right here. No worries about that. Let us move on. So, CARICOM has been, CARICOM has had a few, let me stop sharing this for a while. CARICOM has had major accomplishments. Now, there are several institutions that CARICOM has um as conceptualized and put into into and implemented there is the we have all the major areas of social development has an institution where where it regards education in regards to health in regards to disaster and risk management. There are institutions within CARICOM that address these issues. Where it regards justice, the CARICOM, the Caribbean Court of Arm, the CCJ, the Caribbean Court of Justice is an institution. It is not fully implemented in all Caribbean countries, in all CARICOM countries, but all CARICOM countries have the CCJ as a, an option for a final court of appeal. It is just a matter of each country fixing or amending their constitution to make this final court of appeal, make CCJ their final court of appeal. And where it pertains to, where it pertains to matters within the region, the CCJ is a court that is used as a court of appeal. I do not know how many of us are familiar with the Shanika, the famous Shanika Mary case, where she was basically, she was discriminated against and she, she, she was given uh, an illegal cavity search. Now, ladies, we know we do not want anybody touching our bodies much more putting their hands in places in our bodies. We are going to go ahead, we are going to feel violated by this, right? And she was singled out basically because she is a Jamaican traveling to Barbados and she was, there was no other basis on which she was singled out and she was taken and she was she was detained and she was given a cavity search and she was then sent back to Jamaica and of course anybody would feel discriminated against feel wronged for being treated in such a way so she went ahead with her lawyers and she took it to court and it was this matter was dealt with at the CCJ because of the fact that it is a it is a matter that would relate to how we we interact with each other within the Caribbean so it is a state versus state or state versus state versus citizen of the state's situation so it would not be sent to England and based on circumstances, it could not be fairly tried in Barbados or be fairly tried in Jamaica. Even if it was fairly tried in Barbados, the perception 
would be that it is not fair because this is a Barbadian judge that is presiding over a matter where his country was accused of being discriminatory in its treatment of a Caribbean national. And that's another achievement of the, the, the of CARICOM slash CS, not really CARICOM, CSME, CARICOM Single Market and Economy, because there is a difference. While both of them are similar and they work together, there is a difference. So on a sidebar, the CSME, CARICOM Single Market and Economy, one of the achievements is that each person within the Caribbean is seen as a member of the Caribbean community, not just Jamaicans, but we are Caribbean nationals. What does this mean? This means that we are able to, we should be able to work, travel and reside in any Caribbean country as a citizen of the Caribbean. So even though you and I have a Jamaican birth certificate, we should be able to go to Trinidad to work if there is a job there that is available to us, which we qualify for. We should be able to go to Barbados to work and all of that. And if you, you are sixth form students, so soon you'll be looking at ads in the paper, ads online that advertise jobs within the region because jobs are advertised regionally. So from time to time, if you pay attention, you will see where jobs are available in Trinidad, Guyana, wherever else within the region because of the fact that you don't need a special work permit so to speak, to go to St. Lucia or to go to Trinidad or to go to um, Barbados to go and get a job there. And neither do they have to have a special work permit to come to Jamaica to work as a Caribbean national. So that is an achievement of the CSME. So let me make it distinctly clear. Coming back to CARICOM, there are challenges within the Caribbean community. As with any institution, as with any coming together of people and countries, there will be challenges. So the Caribbean community has a number of challenges. One of, this, one of these is what was mentioned before, perceived or real unfair treatment. Because some of it is real, some of it is perceived. So within the Caribbean communities, there are countries that can be, yes, somebody add something? Zamoya? Okay, so there are perceived as well as real discrimination issues. So there are some countries that are singled out, Jamaica unfortunately being one of them, as being bad countries. So you will hear it and you will see it if you pay attention closely, you will see where from time to time, Jamaicans have a problem, um, Guyanese have a problem entering countries such as Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados. Yes, yes, Abigail Davis, Work permit is not required for you to work within the Caribbean territories that are a part of the CARICOM single market and economy because you are seen as a citizen of these states. And if you are a citizen of these states, then you would need a special work permit. You need to have the offer of a job or you need, yes, you need to have the offer of a job to go and work. You can't just get up and, oh, I'm going to Trinidad to go and look a job. Not quite so. However, you don't need a special work permit like the Chinese or the Indians that come here to work. If you're coming from say Trinidad. 
And we see where many citizens of other Caribbean countries are in Jamaica working at our universities and our, at our hospitals. And Jamaicans also are at their universities and their hospitals and their schools working. All right, so moving on, I'm going back. So challenges. So there is this perceived and sometimes real discrimination issue where citizens are not seen as equal in some of the member countries. You and quite frankly, we cannot quite blame some persons for having that kind of perception. Unfortunately, Jamaica, I'm a Jamaican, we're all Jamaicans, but we see where we have this problem of crime. And very unfortunately, Jamaicans, when we go anywhere, if we're going to be good, we're going to be very good. And if we're going to be bad, we are very bad. So we go to, as Jamaicans, we go to some of these smaller islands and we create problems. And it is therefore the perception of the citizens within these smaller countries that Jamaicans are a problem or Guyanese are a problem. Um, just last night, I saw a video where in Bahamas, right, in Bahamas, there was this girl, Beckford, I think her name is Shani, Shan, Shadea or something, I can't remember. But her last name was Beckford and she actually stabbed her lover and killed her. She's a lesbian. And whatever the problem was, she stabbed the young lady and the young lady subsequently died from her wounds. And she was on the run and she sent out a video defending herself essentially saying that the woman wasn't her mother or her father, but she, she was hitting her and she cannot hit her and she was defending herself and she didn't stab her to kill her. She was defending herself and if she did, I saw. That's basically what her video was saying. So when events like these take place in these smaller countries, it is not a Jamaica where we have 14 parishes and how many square miles, how many hundred square miles of country. And something that happens in Kingston in a community, small community, may not get to St. Thomas, the news may not get to Portland, it may not get to Westmoreland. It's just maybe persons within the area that are aware of what has happened. In these smaller countries, news travels fast because everybody knows everybody basically. So when you, when something, when some crime takes place, especially crime of a certain nature that the citizens are not used to, it travels quite quickly. And if each time or more often than not, you hear a particular nationality coming up over and over again, then it is going to be a perception, whether accurate or not, that these people are troublemakers. Therefore, entering these countries, there is always a problem with Jamaicans, with Guyanese, with Suds. Are you still hearing me? Can somebody just indicate if they're hearing me? Yes, miss. Okay. Because it said my internet is on. There is always this perceived discrimination. Also, in terms of trade, remember the Caribbean community is we share a free trade, which means that there are no tariffs, there are no, there are no levies, fines, duties, no tax is placed on goods that leave from one Caribbean country to another. So in Jamaica, if we produce, we produce cement, for instance, caracom, car carib cement, sorry. We produce a lot of cement 
and we export cement to countries within the region. Our cement, when it enters the Trinidadian market, there is no tax. There's no importation tax that is levied against our produce. It is treated as if it came from Trinidad. So the same treatment that, that the Trinidadian um, cement gets in terms of being introduced into the market is the same treatment that our produce would get. But again, there is a problem there. Because of the fact that there is no tax or there's no levy on goods imported from the region, what many countries are doing or what some countries have done is that they have taken items from other countries, placed it in their market, and then import, export it, sorry, to other Caribbean territories perpetrating it to be their own when it is actually not their own and flooding the market. Also, there is a challenge in terms of the fact that because of the fact that goods that are sent from other countries coming into a Caribbean country is treated the same. There's no tax, there's no duty on those produce then there is an there is uh, an unfairness in fact that the goods are coming in without a um what you call it now without a tax but because of the fact that there are some countries that are able to produce goods at a cheaper cost than others and therefore local goods will sell for us. So for instance, in Jamaica here, we know that the cost of electricity is very high. We have a real problem when it comes on to the manufacturing of goods for electricity alone in order to produce goods. In Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad has an advantage where that is concerned because Trinidad actually has oil. And because of the fact that they have this natural resource to their disposal at a cheaper cost than it is available to, to Jamaica, you realize that Trinidad has a very robust manufacturing industry if you go in any supermarket and look on the shelves especially where it concerns snacks, all of those sunshine snacks of them you look on various snacks that you love you love to eat look at the trinidadian made snack and compare it with the Jamaican made snack. Same, same size, same quality. Sometimes maybe the Trinidadian quality is a little bit better. For argument's sake. But the Trinidadian snack is cheaper than the Jamaican snack and stifle our manufacturing industry. And the Manufacturers Association of Jamaica, they have a real problem with this because the market is open, but at the same time, it is, it is kind of closed. As a Jamaican, I intentionally, when I go to the supermarket, when I buy my goods, I intentionally purchase Jamaican produced goods because of the fact that it is going back, the money goes back into my economy, all of it, not part of it. When you buy a Trinidad made, um, when you buy a Trinidad made juice or a Trinidad made, Trinidadian made snack or something that comes from another part of the region, the money 
the profit will stay in Jamaica at the supermarket to pay the workers or whatever. But part of that money goes back to them. So I prefer as a Jamaican, I'm a very, what would you call it now? I'm a very patriotic person. So where I can make a small difference, I do it. So I will purchase my Jamaican made products. And if for any reason I can do no better, then I purchase in that way. Now, it is your duty, I'm going to leave CARICOM, and it is your duty now to go and do some more research on CARICOM and their challenges and their achievements. And I will send you this slide as well, just as soon as I work out the kinks, because some of these links seem not to be working. So we are going to move on. So let me start sharing my screen. University of the West Indies, we have produced in the West Indies, the University of the West Indies, would know that this, you would know that the University of the West Indies is a very well established. So, sorry about that. I don't know what happened to my internet just now and the screen that I was sharing. The University of the West Indies has an exceptional record of producing leaders within the Caribbean and the wider world. You students that are gearing up to go to university, you know that the University of the West Indies is a very established, well-rated worldwide university. So University of the West Indies is rated as the number one university within the region and by extension, it rates among the top universities within the world. The accreditation of the University of the West Indies is well established and it is accepted within the Caribbean as well as the world, right? And of course, you will know there are Nobel laureates from the Caribbean of Caribbean descent that attended the West the University of the West Indies. So, um, Sir Walcott, Arthur Lewis, the Sir um, Derek. Mrs. Davis? Oh, you went out a while ago. Not sure if you're hearing me. Yes, I'm hearing you. Yes, oh, you, I didn't yes. realize. Yeah, I think the internet connection is unstable. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the challenges of our world today. So I was just highlighting how much the, the, the students, the alumni of the University of the West Indies, how 
rated they are worldwide. The Nobel Peace Prize is a very big deal. I don't know how many of you watch Big Bang Theory. I watch Big Bang all. I watched all the seasons of Big Bang. And you know that Sheldon, his, his um, what would you say now? Is, is, is constantly fixated. He was fixated with winning the Nobel, the Nobel Peace Prize. And that is for a reason. It is seen as the most prestigious accomplishment of anybody in any sphere of education, in any sphere of learning. So if you're a scientist and you receive the Nobel Peace Prize, wow, you're a big deal. And we have had, we have had past students of, we have had graduates of the University of the West Indies that have received the Nobel Peace Prize. So, and in a pure, pure university, the University of the West Indies also has more than 23 current and former Caribbean prime ministers and heads of state as UA alumni. That's a big deal because you have somebody like um, Andrew Olness, PJ Patterson. I'm not gonna talk about Michael Manley. Michael Manley was, he, he was always, his socioeconomic status was already up there before he became prime minister. But speak about somebody like um, Percival James Patterson that is coming from grassroots. He's a regular, he, or he was a regular everyday person, born to ev everyday regular people in Jamaica. And he rose and he went on to become prime minister. The University of the West, in West, West Indies is responsible for the education of more than 23 heads of state as well as former ministers, um, prime ministers. Not to mention how many of them in parliament in Jamaica and wherever else in the Caribbean have attended the University of the West Indies. If you should do a poll right now in parliament, I assure you that the majority of those students, those um, politicians, sorry, the majority of those politicians have attended the University of the West Indies at some point in their lives. So the University of the West Indies has a very good record of that. Also, the University of the West Indies as an institution helps to, it has helped to propagate our culture in the Caribbean. A part of education is also culture, right? Notice, those persons that have been educated outside of the region, there are little nuances about them that are different from those persons that are Caribbean learned. So the University of the West Indies, it helps to propagate our culture in the Caribbean. It helps to promote us as a people and to keep our culture. Look at the festivals that take place at the University of the West Indies in past, in the past times. You know, everything has to be realigned now to go in line with the pandemic. But in the past, look at the Philip Sherlock Center. They would have regular theatrical productions. And these are productions that are Caribbean influenced. It helps us as the, the University of the West Indies also helps in the integration movement. Many of those politicians that you see that are in parliament now, and the politicians that are in parliament at say, in say, St. Lucia, 
in say Barbados, in Antigua. They all went to school together or they know of somebody that knows of somebody that went to school with somebody. And that is a big deal because it helps in the whole integration. It helps to keep us together. When we have a common history, when we can talk about things that are, when we have commonalities in terms of our growth and our development, it helps in the whole integrated movement. So the University of the, the West Indies, it has helped, it has achieved that. It has helped in the achievement of propagating the culture as well as the integrated movement within the Caribbean. If me and you are friend, even if we have a little disagreement about or if we have differing views on an issue, we will deal with it in a much better way than persons that see each other as strangers. So the University of the West Indies helps in that. And again, I have links. I have links. I, I, I like using links so you can get the information straight from the source. What I have is a condensation of what I have read and also my interpretation. Maybe when you read it, you will see something more than I have seen. Now, let us look at a few of the challenges that the University of the West Indies face. And I see Mrs. Dimitriya, let's wrap up. Right. Right, so. Yes, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're out of time, but just finish up and then we can go. Right, so the continued success of the university is threatened by the increased cost of education, as with all universities within the region. So the increase in cost of living in Jamaica, the increase in the cost of educating the nation's students, this is a problem for the university and sustainable develop the, sust the sustainability of the university is threatened by their economic costs. Many of the region's brightest and best students are wooed and won by universities outside of the region based on what they have to offer. If we look at our history of even athletes, it is just in our recent past that we see our best athletes staying in Jamaica. Shelly and Fraser Price, Usain Bolt, and um, what's his name, Asafa Powell. Those are, it's this generation of athletes now that have stayed, that have opted to stay within the region to get their education. Most of the country's best athletes, the Merlin Ati, the Grace Jackson Small, the basketballers, I used to work with the Basketball Association and I can tell you every year they come and they do something called Star Search. And what they do is they take the students even from high school age and they put them in schools in the United States and then give them scholarships to study in the United States. And therefore, it adds to our brain drain that we are experiencing. Because from a very small age, these students are wooed and they're taken away. And once they go to the United States or Canada or Russia or wherever, most times they don't opt to come back to the region. So the only thing we have to get from them is foreign exchange. And then there's inequality in the accessibility of funding for students across the region. And if you listen to the debates recently, if you listen, listen to the budgetary debates, that was something that came up even in terms of the student's loan facility. So the inequality in accessing funds allows many students across the region not to access the services of the University of the West Indies. With that, I'm going to leave you. Miss Kushni is getting very nervous now. So I'm going to leave you. Uh, Miss Kushni, I will um, fix the slide and I will send it to you, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. One moment, please. Rhea, Rhea has something to say. Good morning, everyone. Mrs. Davis, on behalf of all the Caribbean Studies classes, 
we would like to thank you for taking time out of your day to teach and interact with us on the topic of regional integration. I hope that we all will grasp and remember what has been taught this morning. Thank you. You are welcome and I will make sure of it by sending the slide so you can read again and again and again. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Mrs. Davis, for a very well done presentation. Thank All right, you very much. You're All right. welcome. Thanks for having me, and I enjoyed being here. Okay, thank you. Okay, ladies, please go to your classes. Bye, Miss. Bye, ladies. Take care. Okay, Miss Kushni. I've been not seeing anything. I'm I'm here. One one more. Mr. Hall. I don't think Mr. Hall is here. All right. Mr. Uh, Hall's name is here. Yeah, Mr. Ball, Mr. Hall, not here. He's here. Okay. Mr. Hall, was it the presentation recorded for the entire session? Because I'm trying to, do you know? Because I got disconnected when my, my light went. Oh. oh, it is still recording. All right, okay. You know, I was very, I was very nervous because my power went almost all day yesterday. Oh. And the day before. I was very nervous. I was wondering if it would go again this morning. Okay, Boy. I guess you're in luck this morning. I said, we well, have different problems these days. <laughs> That's true. Hold on. Mr. Hall, do you have a class now? Yes, okay. So we have to go. I'm going to call it uh, Miss Davis. Mrs. Davis. That's a problem. All right. All right. Have a pleasant day. All right. Bye, Mr. Hall. Bye students. Mm -hmm.